I remember having a conversation at one of the early SRIs, actually, and everyone was talking about meditation, meditation, meditation. And uh, I said, and the other people joined in and said, you know, really, we should be talking about something in the plural because it's like saying sports. It's like everything is the same. That would be ridiculous. You know, curling is not like soccer. It's not like tennis. What we needed was a term that would enable us to very easily be clear that we're talking about something that is multiple. And so that's how we started using the term contemplative, because contemplative practices really emphasizes the plurality of these traditions. Welcome to Mind and Life. I'm Wendy Hassenkamp. My guest today is Buddhist scholar John Donne. John's work focuses on Buddhist philosophy and contemplative practice, especially in dialogue with cognitive science and psychology. He holds the Distinguished Chair in Contemplative Humanities at the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. As you'll hear in our conversation, John has been involved in contemplative science since the earliest studies. In fact, he worked with scientists to help design some of them. Our conversation covers a lot of ground. We start with his path to integrating Buddhism and science and some reflections on the early days of contemplative research. He also unpacks two common forms of practice that are known as focused attention meditation and open monitoring meditation. We then take a deep dive into meta-awareness and we get into subject-object duality. And John tries to help me understand whether anything really exists He also describes the different ways we experience the sense of self and the possibility of transcending the self through hallucinogens and non-dual contemplative practices. That gets us into ideas of decentering and de-reification, and we end with where John thinks the field should go next. This episode is full of references to papers and people that have been central in the development of contemplative science, So please do check out the show notes if you'd like to dig deeper. Also, this conversation, like John's mind, runs at a pretty fast clip. So if you miss something or you want to spend a little time reflecting further, you can always listen again. And I also highly recommend checking out the transcript of this episode. This is a little bit of an aside about transcripts, but I have to say, I'm the person who has these conversations, and I also listen to them numerous times during the editing process. And I still find that as I work on the transcripts for these shows, I always pick up new things that I missed. Somehow the content comes through differently when you're reading versus listening. The mind really is an amazing thing. So anyway, I encourage you to check out the transcript for any episode you're particularly interested in. They're all posted in the respective show notes at podcast.mindandlife.org. It was a great pleasure to speak with John for this. We sat down last year in Germany before the pandemic, where we were together for a number of contemplative science meetings. I hope you enjoy the conversation. I'm very happy to share with you John Dunn. John, thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Glad to be here with you. So I was really excited to talk to you on the podcast because you are a very rare bird, I think, in this field in that you have expertise in uh, Buddhist philosophy and you're a Buddhist scholar. But you also have spent a lot of time talking with scientists and cognitive scientists in particular. So I was wondering if you could just share a little bit about the path that's gotten you here. Okay. Well, I was born in New York City. No. (laughs) Uh, So uh, although I go pretty far back, actually, and maybe say that, you know, part of I've always had an interest in science. Um, I wanted to be an astronaut, so oh. I ended up at the Air Force Academy, United States Air Force Academy. Uh-huh. So this is, for some reason, this has become a kind of part of my my personal biography when uh-huh. I explain how I got where I got, yeah. because part of what happened is that dream kind of fell apart. I couldn't take it anymore, and mm-hmm. I left the academy after two years, and I ended up at Amherst College, where I met Bob Thurman, who was teaching there at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was sort of, you know, in an identity crisis, I guess you could say, really not sure what my life was about. And that's when I encountered Buddhism, which was really a perfect time. And I tell this story the way I remember it is when the first class I took with Bob, which was on some aspect of Buddhism, he would say a few things for five minutes and then he would basically spend the rest of the class goading me. By debating with me about whether I really existed or not. <laughs> Just you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I seem to, this is what I remember. This might be, you know, highly filtered yeah. memory. But uh, 
and the rest of the class kind of being very annoyed by this process, <laughs> I think. But so uh, it might be a slight exaggeration, but uh, so uh, but I because I was uh, had gone, you know, I was interested in science, and I'd actually studied a fair bit of science from my two years at the academy, and um, had an ongoing interest, and in maybe had a sort of orientation like that to some extent. Mm-hmm. So, but I didn't need to take any more courses of that kind, any what we call now STEM courses uh, yeah. uh, when I finished at Amherst. So I didn't do any more really formal education in the sciences ever since then, actually. What I did become very interested in over time was, uh, you know, a key question, because I was especially involved in a style of Buddhism, in Tibetan Buddhism, that's the tradition known as the Gelukpa, and that's the tradition that uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama is, is primarily trained in. And uh, they're very, very philosophically oriented, and they place a lot of emphasis on analysis, rational analysis, mm-hmm. but also on what you can call epistemology. How do you know things? Which means it's all about models of mind, models of inference or, or rational analysis, models of perception, and that leads to you know questions around well, what are what's affect? They don't even have a category of emotion actually, but you know what we call emotions. How do they analyze those? How do we understand how what attention is and how the mind attends to objects? Because all that's relevant to transforming the mind, not just relevant to meditation practice, but you know in general, just what is the mind. Mm-hmm. So because I studied all that stuff and then eventually ended up at grad school at Harvard, I I really wanted to focus especially on epistemology. And I studied a Buddhist philosopher by the name of Dharmakirti, who wrote in Sanskrit in the 7th century. And he's really the most prominent kind of Buddhist epistemologist. And uh, that background then meant that when I ended up eventually, after a couple of years at the University of Lausanne, I ended up uh, at uh, with my first uh, academic job, uh, or my first job as a professor, I should say, as an assistant professor, was the, at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And pretty soon after ending up there, one of my students actually, who wanted to do an independent project on Tibetan Buddhism and mental health, uh, a young woman named Erin Eman, kind of you know, practically dragged me into Richie Davidson's office. <laughs> I had no idea who Richie was. And then we started to talk, you know, and it's like, oh, you know this person? I know, you know, Alan Wallace? Yeah, sure, I know mm-hmm. Alan. Alan taught me Tibetan, you know, when we, when we were together at Amherst. Alan, Alan yeah. taught me Tibetan. And, you know, and this and that and the other thing. And and uh, <laughs> so he it ended up that he needed help doing uh, this, this. They were just starting these ADEPT studies. And this was about when? This is 90, I think end of 99. Late 90s. Okay. So this is maybe very early, early days. Yeah. Of, maybe spring yeah. semester 2000, something like that. Yeah. But, um, so really not much had been going on at no. all in terms of research so or it's meditation. before that famous meeting when His Holiness came, or what's famous to many of us, because yeah. it's the meeting in which His Holiness came to Madison. That's when I met Antoine. Mm-hmm. And Antoine Lutz. Yeah, Antoine yeah. Lutz, yes. And uh, that's when His Holiness had this really touching kind of last conversation over video, which didn't even really exist then. Mm-hmm. I mean, right? There was no right. Skype. Skype yeah. But they set it up with Francisco Varela, yeah. who passed away not long after that. Right. Right. So, so you were there for that? I was there, yeah. yeah. I was really quite moving, yeah. Did you ever meet Francisco? I, I spoke to him on the phone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think once, because yeah. uh, I helped... Uh, work on this book, uh, Sleeping, Dreaming, and Dying. Okay. Uh-huh. And uh, so I once had a brief conversation with him yeah. on the phone, but uh, unfortunately never actually met him. Yeah. Uh, but in, in any case, so then at first I was just going to translate literally the Tibetan for the language. Dalai Lama. Well, no, for uh, the practitioners who were coming into town. Okay. Because many of them couldn't uh, speak English. Gotcha. But then, you know, things kind of develop really quite quickly. I remember Shechen Rinpoche and Mathieu Ricard came, and so Richie said, hey, you should come to this. And we started talking about, well, how would these practices affect things like habituation, for example, after a startle response? Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then we said, oh, you know, this and that. And pretty soon I was just drawn into that conversation. Yeah. And then that was it. <laughs> <laughs> the so rest is history. The rest is history, really. It's, you know, it kind of started out with... First, you know, not just linguistic translation, but really kind of experimental design. And then it started to get into translating, in a sense, the Buddhist theories about the meditation and the techniques. And then also a long period uh, um, when Mingyur Rinpoche was visiting, where Antoine, uh, Antoine Lutz, Mingyur Rinpoche and I in particular, and sometimes Richie would have these really quite long conversations about, you know, how do we do this? And mm-hmm. do we have the right design? Are we looking for the right stuff? And it was really... Quite a quite a fun period, and that's what got all this going. Yeah, right. And that was 
pretty much what broke open the those early studies with Mingarin Pache and Antoine Lutz. Yes. And you and Richie were some of the first that were ever done. Yes, uh, certainly. And I think those are the, you know, there were some earlier studies that were done uh, on Zen practitioners way back when, mm-hmm. even in the 50s, I think. And then uh, there were some studies, of course, uh, TM studies. Sure. But these were maybe the most first time that the first fMRI studies right. for sure with that technology and also working with meditators who really had so much experience. I mean, these are meditators who had been some sometimes you know two three year retreats, and so yeah, it was it was definitely groundbreaking for yeah. sure. So you've then been in dialogue with scientists for twenty years about now. Yeah, I guess uh, that would be two. Yeah, about twenty years. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh my God. I know. And so. Oh my Buddha, I should say. <laughs> right. So, what do you think, in your experience, what's the benefit or value or importance of of having someone like you with a background in Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist studies working with scientists who are doing this research? Well, I think the thing that's probably most important, it's definitely important to have someone who can speak the language, obviously, Mm -hmm. uh, so that you can explain. If you're you're working at all with subjects who don't speak the language, you need to have a translator. So there's that. But there's also, so I, I think the additional, you know, aspect of my background is when I met Bob Thurman way back when, I also then, he brought in a, uh, a visiting uh, professor who, by the name of Tata Rinpoche. Mm-hmm. And Tata Rinpoche, who at that time was abbot of Gyutur Monastery, became my main, I, I actually like, started to study with him. And uh-huh. uh, part of what happened with, with that exposure is that I actually then became really interested, not just in the philosophy, but in the actual practice. Mm. And he was a remarkable person, really, you know, someone who practiced a lot in his lifetime. And you see that sometimes with these people. Richie talks about this too. Sometimes you sort of meet these people and you say, well, I kind of would like to be like that. Mm-hmm. So I started to also practice Buddhism. And, uh, and, you know, I won't go into all the details, but let's just say by the time, you know, I uh, was dragged into Richie's office, I'd already been practicing Buddhism for almost 20 years. Oh, okay. And so it's not just the philosophy. It's also that... I think it's important to have some actual concrete experience with the practices. You don't have to know practice every practice, but to have some understanding of how that works kind of on the ground. Sure. And also not just the philosophy, but the meditation manuals. Because yeah. one of the key things that, one of the, the first thing that Richie, Antoine, and I wrote together, one of the points we made is like, there are books about meditation, modern books. There are uh, classical texts about meditation. There are oral instructions about meditation, and then there are what people actually do. Right. And and those can all be different. Yes. Right? So it's good to know that and to be able to know each of those different phases so, in, so that hopefully one can kind of negotiate those differences. At the same time, both the philosophy and then the meditation manuals, even though... A meditation manual may say one thing, and I've seen this several times, and then you ask a teacher or whatever, and they say, well, yeah, it says that, but we don't do that. Uh-huh. You know, So it may say one thing, but you do another thing. Nevertheless, the, even the fact that it says that still has an impact, right? right? And it's also reflecting some kind of underlying theoretical commitment, or sometimes there are theoretical commitments you're supposed to keep, but you can't really keep them if you practice this way. So there are all these tensions that emerge from that, yeah. and those are things that have effects. But then also, in a more straightforward way, really like knowing what are the models of mind, models of cognition, what are the theories of transformation, either explicit or implicit, that are found in the textual tradition. Uh, That really helps a lot for designing, just even like experimental design. Like, what am I looking for? What's the hypothesis here? And how do I design an experiment to, to check it out? back kind of what's your take on how the field has evolved and i know. think it's it's amazing yeah. like you see those graphs of the number of yeah. articles that you know antoine i think made one of those before there are others who yeah i forget the fellow who runs that mindfulness newsletter mm, who made david one black. david black yeah. yes but uh but antoine made one uh, you know even before that and already so i can't remember when it was some years ago yeah. like 2007 or something even then you could really see some some significant increases yeah. so uh, mind and life in particular had this tremendous impact 
partially through the great generosity of Barry Hershey, who mm. helped to create the Varela Grants. I remember the day that happened, actually, oh, wow. at the SRI. And uh, it's just had a tremendous impact. And so you can just see simply the quantity of research, the number of yeah. people who are doing research. is really, it's tremendous just to yeah. see how much it's exploded. But also, I do think that, you know, we collectively as a community have really contributed to the quality of research, too. One of the aspects of that is a really simple thing is that I remember having a conversation at one of the early SRIs, actually, and everyone was talking about meditation, meditation, meditation. And I said, and other people joined in, or, you know, maybe I wasn't the first to say it, I don't remember. But I said, you know, really, we should be talking about something in the plural. Mm. Because, uh, you know, it's like saying sports, you know, all the same. Sports at least is plural, actually. But, (laughs) you know, it's like everything is the same. Well, it's just that would be ridiculous. You know, curling is not like soccer. It's not like tennis. Yeah. So uh, what we needed was a term that would really kind of, you know, enable us to very easily be clear that we're talking about something that is multiple. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we started using the term contemplative, actually. Mm. Because contemplative practices... Mm -hmm is something that is doesn't quite maybe roll off the tongue quite as easily as meditation, but it really emphasizes the plurality of these traditions. So that was actually right. one of the one of the reasons we started to use that word. Oh, so that's, that's interesting. A, I never yeah, knew that. Yeah, so then you, we saw after a few years, uh, you, instead of having in the abstract, you know, just this is a study of meditation, mm-hmm. people started to talk about which kind of meditation, like exactly what are we doing, yeah. doing here. And then that led us to also... You know, a little bit at, around the same time, actually, we then coined the, the terms F.A. and O.M. Yeah. Can you explain those practices? Yeah, sure. So we in uh, this is a I think this is an article in Trends in Cognitive Science that came out in 2008, I think, or 2007. And it's uh, what is it called? Meditation. Attention monitoring. Yeah, exactly. I can't I never can remember. I know the, the paper title very well. There. But yeah. <laughs> How embarrassing. But uh <laughs> Anyway, uh, I'll put it in the notes on the website. (laughs) Okay, good. (laughs) So in that paper, when we were first formulating it, we were trying to figure out, okay, we need to help people have some easy heuristic way of parsing in some basic fashion differences between meditations and our styles of meditation. And so we created these terms, uh, focused attention and open monitoring or FA and OM. And now that paper has like 2,000 citations, it's literally. The, the seminal paper in yeah, the field, for sure. Because it actually gave people at least some way, mm-hmm. you know, obviously in a very imperfect way, but it gave them some way to st- start to distinguish the kinds of practices they're doing. Because even just saying mindfulness, so people will stop saying meditation, but then they would say mindfulness. But actually, that's not even that helpful either, because right. you could be doing a focused attention style of mindfulness or an open monitoring style of mindfulness. And the way we try to operationalize those is that a focused attention style is basically about maintaining sustained attention on a particular object. There is, There needs to be at the same time, obviously, you have to have some kind of error monitoring so that you know whether or not you're on the object. You mean so, an object could also be like the breath as a It could common. be the breath, yeah. it, could, it could be a visual object, mm-hmm. right? It could be a sound. So there's some object in which one is fo- maintaining attention. Generally, focused attention styles of practice tend to have a fairly narrow object, meaning there's not a... We wrote a later paper in 2015 that introduced introduced this idea of the aperture, you know, Mm -hmm. how, in a sense, how big or small is that uh, focal aperture? In other words, am I focusing very tightly on just the sensations around the nostrils, or do I have a sort of broader focus on the sensations of breathing at the abdomen? Mm -hmm. Am I looking at a small pebble, or am I looking at you know, a much larger object uh, or even the whole sky. So it's like the the size of the spotlight, you yes, could say. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so uh, the focused attention styles all have a spotlight, mm-hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. And most generally, you know, even when you do that kind of st- sky style of meditation, it might start out as if you have a spotlight, but then it will often dissipate. Uh, likewise, uh, when you do focus attention meditations, if it's too large an aperture, it seems like it kind of falls apart. Mm-hmm. So generally, they have a pretty small aperture, like they're focusing on something pretty and narrow. And the more it seems like, the more one is really trying to cultivate sustained attention, Right, the ability to just remain focused on an object, generally the smaller that aperture is going to be. Like mm-hmm. it can't, If it gets too small, that's a problem too. But then there's also a simultaneous with that. So there's like, am I on the object? Am I distracted? Or am I, am I starting to uh, lose the object? 
We talk about two kind of features in the Tibetan tradition coming from India. We talk about two basic problems in meditation are agitation, which is called in Tibetan jingu. So there's uh, jingwa means a kind of sinking or dullness mm-hmm. or laxity. Like a and sleepiness. Kind, kind of. of. It's not doesn't have to be sleepiness, mm-hmm. actually. Sleepiness is a very gross form okay. of it. And then gupa, which means like excitement or agitation or even just arousal, mm-hmm. right? high arousal, or, uh, that's a scale. And it's, in a way, jingu itself is a scale of arousal. Because mm-hmm. like in Tibetan, if I want to say temperature, I say tsarang, which means hot-cold. Mm. There's no word for temperature. The scale. It's like you say hot-cold. The endpoints of... Yeah, tsarang yeah. katsure. How much is the temperature? It's like you say tsarang. So jingu is really, probably, we should just call that arousal, uh-huh. degree of arousal. Yeah, that's how it would right? be in cognitive so, science. Yeah. Right, so one end of that scale is very is where you have very low arousal, and that heads down eventually into sleepiness, mm-hmm. right? And then you go higher and higher and higher, and then you're starting to get toward the gupa end when it's when you have this kind of excitement or agitation, right? And what does that feel like subjectively? So one of the ways that that feels like, and uh, very often a kind of symptom of of this kind of uh, arousal, high arousal or gupa excitability is that you just feel like suddenly you have so many thoughts, Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. know, that would be one of them. Or you try to focus on an object and your mind just goes immediately to something else, even Mm -hmm. if it's not a thought, like another sensation or something like that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it even involves like physiological, like jitteriness Mm -hmm. and so on. Right, just like the opposite end, like the the physiological expression of really low arousal of the, of jingwa, mm-hmm. is you fall asleep, and so there right. are can be physiological expressions of really high arousal where there's like muscle muscle tension and you know m- muscle sure. ticks and stuff like that. Do you think this relates to the actual amount of energy in well, the body? Well, I mean, sure, yeah. This yeah. so yeah, the Tibetans would talk about this in terms of lung, mm. which is vayu uh, in Sanskrit, not prana actually, but vayu. But in any case, so it also, like in the medical literature, when you're having really kind of a lot of stress or mm-hmm. you're feeling, you know, anxiety, agitation, that means you have a lot of lung, mm-hmm. right? Which is uh, this kind of energy in the body. And if we have too much of that, it can be really quite, uh, quite negative. Mm-hmm. And you can induce that by meditation. There mm-hmm. is a, a particular kind of uh, wind illness. So lung means wind. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a metaphor for energy. Mm-hmm. And you, there is a something called life wind illness, soklung, which uh, it can be induced by meditating improperly or mm. meditating too hard, mm. so to speak. And it basically looks like generalized anxiety disorder, oh, pretty much, sometimes with psychotic symptoms. Mm. Anyway, uh, when we're trying to understand the way in which these practices are working, right, one of the things that's important about the, the way in those practices are developed is you've got theoretically this notion, but seems to be also developed in very practical ways of this degree of arousal, and then there are going to be techniques to actually counteract that degree of mm-hmm. arousal. So that's an example of where the indigenous theories can actually be very helpful for us to understand what meditators are doing in terms of technique. Right. So anyway, to get back to like the FAOM distinction, mm-hmm. the distinction between focus attention and open monitoring. So when you're doing focused attention practice, one of the things you're monitoring for is this degree of arousal. Right. Like, do you have, you know, how much jingu is there? Mm-hmm. And you need to have that. Now, there's some uh, traditions say that that's a kind of intermittent um, kind of introspection or mm-hmm. meta-awareness mm-hmm. where you have to actually drop the object and check how you're doing. Mm-hmm. There's That's one account. But another account that is favored by the non-dual traditions is that the kind of capacity to notice how, the quality of the meditation practice, because you can notice the claim is even while you're on the object, you, an, uh, especially a, an expert meditator can start to notice whether there's getting too much arousal or too little arousal. Right. And so they can notice that without losing the object, without doing an introspection. So that means there's this other feature, which you could, in a rough sense, call meta-awareness, that is, but it's implicit. It's like constantly running in the yeah. background during that kind of practice, right? And so you're sort of aware of, you're monitoring the quality of your attention on an object, and then what you can do is you can just drop the, mod, the object, and now you're just monitoring. That's what we called uh, open monitoring. A lot of people, like Mathieu Ricard, really didn't like that because... Huh. You know, if you're in the if you're in a non-dual tradition, the implication of over-monitoring is there's something to monitor, which means you're still in a dualistic kind of 
you know, stance. Right. And of course, beginners are when they do this. And when, I want to unpack the non-dual thing in a minute. Okay. Um, so beginners yeah. are like that. When mm-hmm. they, in, in other words, you know, when they first try to do this kind of what we, is in, in like in the Mahamudra style would be called uh, uh, objectless shamatha, shamatha without a support. So when you first try to do that, there's still a very strong kind of dualistic orientation. But there are also traditions that do something like this. Like you find many Vipassana teachers teach something that's kind of like this, where you don't develop a lot of focused attention style awareness on, let's say, the breath at the nostrils, but then maybe eventually move to a point where you stop focusing on anything in particular and you simply attend to whatever arises. Mm-hmm. So that's how the practice is. Well, we would put under that rough rubric of open monitoring. So you mentioned a couple terms that I think it'd be worth um, just unpacking a little bit. One is meta-awareness, and you described it uh, somewhat, but maybe if you could just kind of give a, a succinct description of what that means, as some people might not be familiar. Well, there's a little debate about right. what it means exactly, <laughs> but and, and Evan Thompson, Jonathan Schooler, uh, uh, who's participated in a number of minor life events, he's at UCSB, Evan's at University of uh, British Columbia, and myself just wrote a paper on this uh, uh, mindful meta-awareness, we called it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, Jonathan's early work on meta-awareness was really very influential, continues to be very influential. And one of the ways he uh, conceptualized meta-awareness is that it's, for example, the moment that you notice that as you've been reading, you know, a scientific article or, or something... And like you get three paragraphs, four paragraphs, and then you realize, I have no idea what those paragraphs meant, <laughs> right. right? I've never had that happen. No, no, of course not. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that moment of noticing is a moment of meta-awareness, because as Jonathan put it early on, I think around 2000, he says it's basically just noticing the current contents of mind. Okay. A very simple kind of right. d- definition. So being aware but it's of what's an explicit going on. judgment about it. Like, oh, I am not paying attention. Or, oh, I am daydreaming about a beach in the Bahamas right now. So that is an explicit moment, right? Mm-hmm. That happens at a moment. Mm-hmm. And part of what, you know, in a series of conversations that uh, Jonathan and Evan ha- and I had a little while ago, and we may pick up again at some point, you know, we were saying, well, this. That seems to be only capturing part of what's happening when you do uh, uh, certain kinds of practices. So even in a focused attention practice, you're focusing on your breath or some some object, and then at some point you notice, as inevitably you do, mm-hmm. right? Oh, I'm you know thinking of, I'm planning my lunch, mm-hmm. and uh, that moment is a moment of explicit meta awareness where I right. at a particular moment I make a judgment like, oh, I am doing X, right? Yep. and it's often in a linguistic form actually. Yeah. Sometimes, so, although sometimes I feel like it can It could just not be, be but yeah. John, some of Jonathan's work suggests that it's mm-hmm. often got a linguistic, mm-hmm. it sort of presents itself in a, 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 a subjectively in a linguistic way. Mm-hmm. The phenomenology of that moment often involves a kind of, you know, inner uh, uh, vocalization. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But of course, that has to come from somewhere. The ability to detect it. Yeah, unless you're, unless you're just constantly kind of switching and monitoring inward, which mm-hmm. means you're dropping the object constantly, mm-hmm. right? Unless that's the model. An alternative model is that there is some kind of capacity to be aware that is giving us information about, in a sense, not just the current contents of mind, but the current processes, like mm. what's going on not on the object, but uh, more generally. Mm-hmm. So, for example, you know, as I'm talking to you right now, and I say, eh, boo, eh. <laughs> and then I ask you, when I said boo, were you sitting down? You say, yes. yes. Yeah, and, it, and is that an inference? Like, you know, oh, well, I don't remember getting up. <laughs> and I would think I remember sitting, at last time I checked, I was sitting down. Or, you know, that moment you're almost still in your working memory maybe i mean it's right there for yep. you available but that encoded with 
the memory of the sound, which is what you were attending right. to, is the, your body position. That's right. So that's being presented to you in your experience, but you're not attending not to that, right? But that's constantly being presented. Mm -hmm. So that's this idea of what we call implicit meta-awareness mm -hmm. that we think is not intermittent, it's sustained. So that's always happening so that's ostensibly for everyone? Right, yes. In a way, there is one position which says this is actually an ongoing feature of every moment of consciousness, right? right? Mm -hmm. But whether that's the case or not, when we're doing these kinds of practices, the idea in, in open monitoring style of practice is that when you drop the object, which is what you do in the open monitoring, so the monitoring is always going on, mm -hmm. right? This sort of background, sustained, implicit awareness that's presenting to you things like your body position, but also the state of your awareness, mm -hmm. your affect, right? That that, and that's how we get the signal, so to speak, to then make a judgment, oh, I'm distracted. So that's the theory here. This is presenting information about the quality of our awareness, and sometimes that becomes salient. Right, that was going to be my question. So if it's always going on in the background, but certainly at least as an early meditation practitioner, you're not aware of right. it for a lot of the time until that moment well, when you somehow become so that, aware. But that moment comes from somewhere. And I, mm -hmm. I think there's basically, so we have, you know, various kinds of, you know, competing streams for our, for our explicit or conscious attention or mm -hmm. a kind of attention that we can report about. So there may be a kind of attending, and that's a little bit of a difficult term because it means we're focusing on an object. But yeah. there's, we may have, sometimes we talk about the distinction between phenomenal awareness. Ned Block, the philosopher, developed this idea, phenomenal awareness and access consciousness. Mm. And a very simple way of putting it is, you know, when I'm doing something that the level of access consciousness, I can make an explicit judgment like, oh, I see that. Mm -hmm. But I can still sense things. And so there's a literature on noetic feelings, for example, that's about this. I can sense things and not in a sense even know that I'm sensing them. Mm -hmm. So part of this is probably the way we would account for the fact that if we show you a face and it's too fast or it's masked in some way, even though you can't explicitly report on whether it looked angry or not, it still affects your behavior. Right. You've somehow encoded that information. Yes. So that when we ask you, we show you a neutral face at, later, and if we just showed you an angry one that you didn't really, you don't know you just saw it, you still report the neutral face as being less pleasant, right. for example, so right? It's like contaminating the moment of yes. experience. Yes, which means that in some sense you were aware of it. Yes. Right? Or your not system. Not consciously, but Right. Or, somehow. well, not, but not, that word conscious is really yeah, tough. That's, like, yeah. Like, maybe if we did train you, maybe you... You could become. Maybe you, or maybe if we did a micro-phenomenological interview on you, we'd discover that actually you were aware of it. You just, yeah. you know, so maybe. Maybe. Yeah, so who knows? Yeah. But in any case, uh, uh, that, so there's something that's presenting that information, right? Like the way that works, and this is a good example of meta-awareness is what's really being presented there is not the face, it's our emotional response, our affective response to the face. So that affect, so on this theory, like affect is part of what's being presented by meta-awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, let's say I'm having a conversation and, you know, this is like an academic danger. And I'm sure I used to be more like this when I was younger, like you're in a conversation, it's getting really heated debate about something and, you know, people are getting more and more irritated and I'm getting like more and more like, yeah, yeah, you know, and then finally uh, I realized well, I've won the debate, but I've lost a friend, uh -huh. right? Why? Because I, this channel uh, that was presenting my affect to me was like, the, the signal wasn't strong enough. Mm -hmm. So part of what meditation practices can do is, in a sense, improve the strength of that signal, of that meta-awareness signal. So when I use that metaphor, what I mean is this, you know, if we're sitting here and suddenly there's a loud sound, mm -hmm. that's going to capture our attention. It's going to become salient, right. right? Why does it become salient? Because one of the sort of ongoing tasks is what David Meyer calls the task of life, right? Mm -hmm. And meaning you're going to survive, and or at least that's part that's of the, the task of life. Task. Yes, yeah. right. So a loud sound is this kind of anomalous thing that we got to pay attention to. It becomes salient. So whereas there are other soft sounds that are actually all auditory, you know, uh, a system is actually detecting, mm -hmm. but it, they're not salient. Right. They don't, you know, we we can't report on them. We don't, um, we don't, they don't capture our attention. But that information is being processed to some level anyway. Mm -hmm. And in any case, uh, uh, you know, it's got to be available there for it to actually become salient at some point, right? Right. So likewise, we have 
information from our senses, but we also have information in a sense from the sort of mental channel, so to speak, meaning there's all of that information about affect. It may actually be something you could decompose into more than just one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and we can talk about proprioception and interoception, and this may all be bound together into this, what we're right now calling meta-awareness. Mm -hmm. In any case, you, that's, you know, the concept, at least as I understand it, is that all that's also being constantly being presented, but then there are times when it becomes salient. Right. So, and why would it become salient? Because it's important. So if my task is to stay on my breath, then if my, you know, uh, that's going to kind of prime that particular, uh, so I'm holding that task, that's the task set that I'm retaining in that moment, and then there's information that's relevant to that task, and when that information becomes strong enough or clear enough, then it's going to become salient, and I'm going to go, oh, I'm not on my breath anymore. Ah, so whatever becomes salient is determined by kind of your intention in that moment or what right. you just call the so task set. That's right, exactly. So let's, you know, if the task set uh, uh, of your meditation probably doesn't include the sensation in your right big toe most mm -hmm. of the time, that information is available. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like when your right big toe uh, moves slightly, please, uh, you know, I don't know, stand on your head. That's the <laughs> new practice that we're developing. Uh, to save the world. No, probably <laughs> not. Uh, so, uh, but you know, that, so then it would become relevant. Right. And that might be something that watch your breath, but if you're right to move, or if you feel, you know, uh, uh, moving in your lower body, uh, then uh, do, do something. Do something. Right. So normally it's watch your breath. And if you realize your mind is somewhere else, yes. then come back to the breath. Right. So the idea is that there can be this kind of information that's often, it's probably, certainly information, I would think it's probably also interoceptive and proprioceptive information, but it's definitely what we could think of as affect and other features of cognition that are being presented to us as a feature, just like your sitting position was presented to you as a feature of your memory of me making that sound. Mm -hmm. So constantly this is kind of being presented to us. And then there are kinds of meditation that are really trying to kind of up that signal, make it stronger, because it's a really good signal. Like if you want to do emotion regulation, you need to notice your emotional state. Yeah. And that's not a matter of constantly looking inward, because if you had to do that, you would, you know... Couldn't do anything else. You couldn't do anything <laughs> else. So... Uh, the styles of practice that do that are pra like all mindfulness practices do that because they emphasize to some degree this kind of monitoring. But then other practices do it. There are styles that do it even more because what they do is they drop an object. And now you're just trying to sustain that meta awareness without focusing on any object. So just monitoring whatever's happening. Right. But then at some point, you even drop that kind of attitude of monitoring something. Okay. And now you're into what would, you know, a term we could use there is open awareness. Mm -hmm. That's a very particular kind of practice that you only find in traditions that are trying to cultivate a non-dual state, meaning a state in which you're not, there's no structure of a subject focusing on an object. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the non-dual. Can you say a little bit more about what, what it means to be in a dualistic experience? Actually, this starts to get into the idea of where it's not just, we're not just talking about meta-awareness. Uh, we're also talking about something that's kind of more like a feature of consciousness, which is reflexivity. Mm -hmm. And that's very, it's very, but on, obviously, because of the way I think about these things. And I think the way, uh, especially, probably both Evan and Jonathan, but maybe especially Evan thinks about it. We had a debate like, should we try to get into this or not? Mm -hmm. And when uh, Antoine, Amishi Jha, and uh, Cliff Saren and I wrote that uh, paper in 2015, an American psychologist that we called the cube paper because yes. it's got that cool cube diagram. <laughs> right, figure one. That's yeah, great. we also thought about, you know, do we want to get into reflexivity when we talked about meta-awareness? There we didn't even use the implicit. We just kind of used this, you know, like it's a judgment. It's mm -hmm. a moment of, of noticing. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, reflexivity is important here because it is... Uh, when you hear that sound or if you just look at something here, you know, have a look at the microphone or something like that. When you do that, you have a sense of it being over there, mm -hmm. right? Which means you have to have a sense of also there being in here. Yes, I'm over here. Yeah. You are over but there. But you're not focusing on the you in there, are you? That's nope. not an object, is it? Nope. I hope not. That would be <laughs> kind of weird. That would be weird. That would be quite a trick, actually. <laughs> you could do both of those. So you're so you have an object focus over here on a visual object, yeah. right? But at the same time, 
precisely even that sense of it being located somewhere means that there's a sense of there an in hereness, which is like a sense of subjectivity, like there's a seer, mm -hmm. the agent, the, the apparent agent of the you know the moment of seeing something, right? So that's also being presented. Yes. But it's not being presented as an object. You know, like when I teach this in class, I'll make a sound or something like that. And I'll say, oh, well, you're sitting down, mm -hmm. you know, and people say, oh, yeah, yeah obviously, mm -hmm. you know, and like, how yeah. do you know that? And then they go, oh, yeah, I guess I just, it's just part of the experience. Yeah. And then I do it again, make another sound, you know, and then, uh, and then I say, so were you the one hearing the sound or was it somebody else? And they go, oh, what? <laughs> because it's, you know, it's so obviously obvious. Obviously it's me, yeah. Yeah, of course, unless you have certain kinds of psychopathologies. Right. But yeah, obviously, you know, in our ordinary kind of uh, experience, it, there's just this sense of being the hearer of a sound. Yes. Right? But that's, we're not focusing on that as an object. We're focusing on the sound. Right. So that means that that's constantly being presented. Both the object and the subject are being presented. And in the non-dual traditions in Buddhism, and actually outside of Buddhism too, but we'll just focus on Buddhism, and these would basically be in, in Tibet, the ones that I know best and that you know we, we've done some research on in terms of contemplative practices, is our Mahamudra and Dzogchen. And uh, you know the style that I'm most familiar with actually combines both of those. So the main feature of these non-dual styles and Zen tradition, you know, Chan, Zen, Sion, and Kriya, and so on, they are also non-dual traditions. Mm -hmm. And the main feature of these traditions is that, uh, without going into a huge amount of detail, is that, you know, suffering is caused by a fundamental cognitive defect. Early Buddhism says the fundamental cognitive defect has to do with the way we conceptualize our own personal identity. Then, there, then Buddhist philosophy develops, and eventually we get to the point at which, well, actually, no, the fundamental defect is deeper than that. It's the mere fact of there being a structure in consciousness or cognition that presents objects and subjects. So to see what's really going on, right, you have to see the moment of consciousness or experience consciousness without that defect, which means you have to experience it without subject-object duality. Right. So there's a whole story about why that makes sense. Just saying it right now, just like, what are you talking about? Why would that follow? So there's an argument. I mean, we could go through it, but yeah. there's a condensed version we could go through. But basically, yeah, yeah. very briefly, I will say this much. So okay. when you look at a visual object, like even as a scientist, you know that like the color red of this object over here, right, is not outside of your mind. Right. Because color isn't doesn't exist in the world. It's if we're even if we're very you know, we'll be very physicalist about it and say you know there are photons. There's some substance Certain here. Certain wavelength and, of and, light. Right, yeah, and, and photons aren't red. Right. Right. They're, the red is the construct in my mind. Exactly. That corresponds. Right. Yeah. So and that's the way your visual system encodes photons at that particular frequency. Mm -hmm. Right. So where is the red? In the mind. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It's a, it's within your consciousness. Yeah. So therefore, that means that we're. It seems like we're always seeing stuff outside of our mind, but actually, we're seeing the effects of the interaction of our visual system with that stuff. Mm -hmm. But what is actually presented in experience is in consciousness, mm -hmm. right? So that's just presumably every uh, scientist of vision would accept that, right? There, there are philosophers who really don't want to believe that. Western philosophers, but. Pretty much, you know, I can't imagine a cognitive scientist who would say otherwise. Yeah, no, that's pretty dogma. Yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah, pretty straightforward. Yeah. So th this is the same kind of position, actually, which is that, you know, there's a, there's a cause for the visual cognition, but the actual, um, what you actually see, so to speak, in your experience, like the color red, is not a thing in the world. It's a product of the interaction of your sensory system with some causes, and you see red as a mm -hmm. result. So really the thing I'm beholding in my mind is not out there. It's right, encoded there is, as being out there. There are things out there. Well, it's encoded as being out there. Uh -huh. So at a, you know, one level of Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist philosophy has these levels of analysis, uh -huh. you know, we kind yep. of lead you along the primrose path, so to speak. <laughs> and so at, at one level we say, yeah, of course, it, it isn't outside your mind, but the reason it looks like it's outside your mind and, and therefore you have an out-thereness and an in-hereness, even though both of those are just in your mind, right? Mm -hmm. The in-here and the out-there are nothing other than just that moment of consciousness. Mm -hmm. But it, there looks to be this differentiation of in-here, out-there, because the cause of this red image I'm seeing is outside my mind, mm -hmm. or was, because it's something this, in the world yeah something in the world yeah. that interacted with my sense so that's why it looks so it's just an accurate representation in a sense 
of uh, you know the features of the cause, right? So the this stuff outside the, my mind that caused me to see blue or red or whatever, it's outside my mind. So that's why even though what I'm actually seeing is inside consciousness mm -hmm. within the field of consciousness, it looks like it's out there because it's just faithfully encoding the fact that the stuff that caused it is out there. Mm -hmm. But on this level of philosophy, there's no stuff out there. Oh no. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Well, there there's you go. other levels though where there is stuff out there right yeah you can just stay think, at the lower level yeah, think, if you want <laughs> so this doesn't mean that everything we don't exist is, in a vacuum this no 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 there's still causes that's right right there's a and physical we, reality no you, there isn't. it looks physical to you okay. and that's a model you bring to it there are causes for your perceptions uh -huh. but the stuff that the causes that make up the causes uh -huh. is not matter on this level of analysis okay okay so it's uh it gets complicated <laughs> but one way of thinking about the major influence on this kind of non-dual approach and the styles of practice that are non-dual styles of practice is their influence especially by a form of buddhism called yoga chara which literally means practice of yoga and that style of buddhism says that those causes are actually the kind of stuff that is your mind seems to be made of like there's the inside and the outside they're actually made of the same kind of stuff mm -hmm. so it doesn't mean that the that everything kind of gets sucked into the subject side like everything is just you know okay. your sense of subjectivity is the reality no because right. that if there's no outside there's also no inside okay so the subject and the object both have to go. But whatever is making uh, all the stuff, all the causes of our perceptions and, you know, our mental experiences are all made out of the same kind of stuff. So in Tantra, that's a kind that will then move to models where you say it's made out of energy, mm -hmm. right? And it, it gets a lot more complicated and some of the traditions, you know, kind of hem and haw about this and so on and so forth. We don't need to get into it. But in any case, this is that's just the metaphysics, right? There's mm -hmm. a basic claim. But you can do this practice, you know, it, it, whether or not you can drop that kind of subject object duality, even if there's, uh, what's causing the sense impressions are external. So how do you drop that sense? Well, that's, yeah, that, how do you do that? So in <laughs> other words, you, and it could still be very, very useful, especially therapeutically, because part of what happens is we get really fixated on our sense of subjectivity. And we think we're just kind of, you know, there's no way we can change or we have a very negative sense of ourselves. Right. So we get a very inflated sense of ourselves or whatever. When you say the sense of uh, subjectivity or the subject object division, to me, that sounds really exactly like the sense of self that we talk about so in there psychology. Are two, two ways of talking about self, though. One of them is the self as a kind of object, like a character in a story. Okay. When I With think an about myself. So mm -hmm. a lot of the time when we have like schema, self schemas, mm -hmm. Like I have, you know, a schema where I'm a jerk and I'll always be a jerk. And But those models are really like I'm looking at myself as yeah. if I'm looking at somebody else. Yeah. So I'm turning myself into an object okay. and describing myself. But there's also uh, another arguably subtler and maybe more important, mm -hmm. um, a therapeutically more important sense of self as the one who's doing stuff, mm -hmm. the one who's seeing Agent. stuff, you know, the seer, the hearer, the feeler, right? Mm -hmm. And that also we can get, we can have a sense that, you know, part of our sense that, well, I can't change. So we have a story about ourselves and we feel it can't change. But that also can be rooted in a sense that that subjectivity also doesn't change. Right. So having an experience in which it radically changes or even disappears, and this is like one of the hypotheses about what happens in psilocybin and other mm -hmm. psychedelic experiences mm -hmm. and why they may be helpful for people who have treatment-resistant depression. Right is that they kind of hit it, as uh, Robin Carhart Harris, who's worked a lot on this, says, it's like hitting the reset button. Mm. You know, ego dissolution is a hypothesis that's relevant here. Yeah. That it's kind of, you fall apart, and then and you realize, wow, like all this BS I'm telling about myself is, like, is radically wrong, because not only does the story disappear, I disappear. Like my sense of being the ones thinking or the ones seeing, even mm -hmm. that like falls apart. So that can be really therapeutically powerful, even if you don't have the metaphysics like, oh, there isn't really stuff out there and mind in here. Right. So it can be a powerful moment. And also you can do practices that induce that kind of a moment. So those are the practices you find in, in the various non-dual traditions. And they are often involved, like a very beginning style of that is it starts with what we call shamatha, which is stabilizing the mind. Like an F.A. Right. And it would start with an F.A. style very often, like in Mambudra anyway. And actually, you find this 
in many of the non-dual traditions, even when it's not explicitly discussed, like you'll focus on some object initially, and then you start to develop that monitoring capacity, and then you slowly kind of let go of the focus. Alan Wallace has this nice metaphor that maybe you found in some text somewhere, which is just like you have your hand on a buoy in the water, mm -hmm. and then you sort of slowly pull it back and let go. Mm -hmm. So the breath, for example, if you're using your breath as a focus, it's you first focus on the breath and then slowly, slowly, slowly just kind of release uh, lighter and lighter uh, uh, focus on the breath or attention on the breath, and then you just stop attending. What's left is that so-called monitoring, mm -hmm. meta -awareness. which still is probably very dualistic because it's kind of, well, is there something, wait, where to go, where to go? But then eventually that dualistic sense of it sort of starts to dissipate and it becomes a truly non-dual awareness, uh, so they say, uh, which you could call an open awareness. So that's a way of trying to describe that kind of truly non-dual state, which is really beyond the uh, open monitoring kind of state. Right. Remember, open monitoring is not a Buddhist term, nor is focused attention. Right. There are just heuristic terms that are meant to kind of roughly categorize different kinds of practices. So we at least could start, you know, saying not this is a meditation study. Like, oh, okay. Does it mean like right. a sports study? They were, know? yeah, they were developed to help researchers. Yeah, get to at some least idea a little bit start to parse work. the right. different kinds right. of practices. So, and they've been super helpful. I mean, I feel like most papers. Yes, there are a lot of papers refer to those, and Richie and Antoine and uh, Cortland Dahl mm -hmm. at our center. They wrote another paper, a little kind of like a follow up to that mm -hmm. paper that introduces some additional kind of categories like a deconstructive practice yep. and a constructive practice. And yep. in our cube paper it was also intended to try to give yeah. people the tools to maybe specify in a, in a somewhat more finely grained way yeah. what kind of practices they're looking at. Because that's really important, you know. Yeah, you have to be able to compare apples to apples. If yeah, you're gonna... and it's still the case that a lot of the time, uh, you know, I was just involved in a research conversation in which we were talking about meditation. Yeah writ large yes and it's very rarely the case that that makes sense actually talking about this experience of self or the subjective side kind of dissolving. Yes. What do you think are the impacts of that in terms of one's experience in the world or, you know, one's struggles maybe with, you mentioned clinical relevance? Well, I think one of the things, so again, if you think of like a psilocybin experience, people fall apart in that way also, but mm -hmm. this is in, in, in induced by, by the medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, hypothetically, and we don't, I don't think anyone really knows this yet, but people are really working on this. Hypothetically, that experience and the memory of it and the retelling of the story of the self that's made possible by that, that is their therapeutic kind of secret ingredient of psilocybin, right? So that it basically wipes out, you know, the story and even the self who could tell a story, and then when it, it comes back, it's like, oh man, that, that wasn't true. That's mm -hmm. not who, uh, that whole story about myself is just a story, right? And even the sense that there's kind of a fixed self in there who can't change, even that feeling is not true, because it just went away, like the whole thing, yeah. you know? So you could therapeutically also maybe not go all the way there, because that's pretty hard to do in a meditation practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, it can happen to people. And some, now one of the issues, you know, with this kind of style of practice is it can sound like a dissociation in a yeah, way, right? Yeah, I could imagine. So, and, it, and it's a target, like a dissociative state is a kind of target. And what, But what's important is that you have to contextualize that state. So like in, in psilocybin, when people are uh, using psilocybin for therapeutic treatment, the key thing is that the, the interviews, the integration sessions that are done after the dosing, yeah. right? Yeah. To create a framework that's helpful. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and also very often, either explicitly or implicitly, they kind of set people up too. Yeah. And beforehand. Uh, before yeah, the exactly. And the same is really true uh, in meditation. Like meditation, it's a tech, you could say we could talk about technique, but there's also all of the context 
before and after meditation sessions and mm -hmm, sure. whatever experiences might arise. So, you know, one of the issues, I think, when we sometimes see certain kinds of uh, uh, people encounter certain kinds of problems with meditation, sometimes they have like these dissociative experiences, but they haven't been properly contextualized. Right. And they don't know what to do with that. Right. But if they're properly contextualized, where like your sense of self begins to kind of dissolve and, you know, you're not sure where the world, where you begin and the world ends or where the world ends and you begin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, are you the other person or is the other person mm -hmm. you? And like all it's all kind of, you know, becoming somehow like just completely interpenetrated right. and uh, which could be really scary which could you, could be really scary yeah. if you're really clinging cl uh, very tightly to the self yeah. and of course people in in psychedelic experiences often have fear yeah but if if you're kind of prepared for it right and it's like this is going to happen mm -hmm. and you know we, this way of just seeing that there's a plasticity to your own identity mm -hmm. things might start to dissolve a little bit and often in meditation it's not a matter of complete dissolution into mm -hmm. into a non-dual state that's relatively rare uh, especially in people who haven't meditated a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but there can even just be a little bit. Even a people, little. I've been in context where I've, I can teach a style of practice called, you know, uh, objectless shamatha, as I described. Mm -hmm. You know, and when I sometimes teach that to people, uh, there are people who occasionally like say, oh, you know, I've started to disappear. And they, you know, you have to mm -hmm. be sure you intervene and make them feel comfortable. But they're also prepped ahead of time. Yeah. So and even if that prepping is really a priming, like for right. them to start to notice a little dissolution, nothing wrong with that. We're not, you know, doing an experiment here. Mm -hmm. Like, does this technique work? Like, yeah. if all we need to do is prime Suggest. people and they just conceptually have an experience of dissolution, that's just fine. Yeah. You know, yeah. so the point is that there needs to be, again, not total dissolution, which is rare, but this sense like, oh, like the kind of, you know, assumption that there's this fixed subjective standpoint starts to fade a little bit and when that fades obviously the story of the person is going to fade mm -hmm. right because the story is about somebody but if that person you know like if we're telling a story of uh, frodo baggins but frodo baggins keeps flipping in and out of existence it's like <laughs> right. wait a second where'd frodo go you know what's the story about <laughs> the story now? is not so powerful <laughs> yeah, yeah right well there isn't a story because yeah. there isn't a frodo to talk about yeah. you know so, so that's the idea there. That it actually kind of, at a very foundational level, gives one a you know like a visceral experience, not even necessarily of just you know these techniques of not necessarily inducing really non-dual where where the subject object structure totally collapses, but even it just kind of weakens a little bit. Mm -hmm. And there's this sense of you know things becoming a little dissolving, or the sense of subjectivity like you know not being so sharp and clear anymore. And that can be very powerful if if it's you know contextualized in the right way. And so having that lessen or dissolve or kind of destabilize a little bit, the idea is that that would reduce suffering because the suffering is coming from the original clinging to that? Well, yes. So, I mean, then in the Buddhist world, the suffering is certainly coming to clinging to the to a sense of a fixed identity, mm -hmm. which is certainly caught up in a fixed sense of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. But then, you know... The, the non-dual traditions will say this, you know, even just this idea that there's a real world, objective world out there. Not only is there no, like, fixed subject in here, there isn't a fixed objective world out there either. Mm -hmm. And that's also, that belief is also part of the stew of suffering. I mean, that's I also what is producing suffering. But we don't need to, as I said before... Right. That those metaphysics, right. right, those accounts of what the ultimate nature of reality uh, might be, are not necessary... Uh, in order to do the practice or to have therapeutic results from right. that practice. And this also feels like the concept of decentering, which is, is related to related. mindfulness and it's a less extreme form of this, maybe. Well, decentering is an extremely like ill defined term it is. as far as yeah. I'm concerned. There are kind of two separate features that are really, I think, important to separate when we talk about this kind of phenomenon, because this is not decentering what we're mm -hmm. talking about, on my view. Okay. So one aspect of decentering is uh, something that's more like psychological uh, distancing, where like Ethan Cross's uh, kind of model, where you kind of, instead of being so completely f uh, involved with your mental content, it's like you sort of step back like you're a fly on the wall, and you try to try to see it like in, a, in an objective way. So mm -hmm. you, and often even the phenomenology of that is like it, it actually kind of, you feel a sort of mm -hmm. mental distance, like you just step back yep. as a metaphorically, mentally, and you sort of look at it like more objectively. Mm -hmm. 
And that also has, you know, he and his people have done some research which suggests that also has really useful, you know, therapeutic outcomes. Mm -hmm. Is that what decentering is? Some people seem to think that's what decentering is. But then there's also a more, very much more specific kind of uh, um, event and a skill involved in this event, which is tied to this kind of moment of, of dissolution in a certain way, which is being able to recognize that a thought is a thought. Mm -hmm. So John Teasdale, I think in a 1999 or 97 article, referred to this as, um, I think, metacognitive insight, I believe, was the term that he used. Mm -hmm. And we decided to use the term dereification because we thought it was much more like is actually described what was going on. Because yeah. something that's reified is made real. So if you dereify something, you make it unreal. So you realize that a thought is not real. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, you know, our cognitive system is has evolved so that thoughts seem real to us. Sure. So like if I think of a strawberry, is how I often use that illustration. You know, everyone thinks seems to think I really love strawberries. <laughs> now, I'd like them, but not that much. Oh, I shouldn't say that. Now they won't give me strawberries anymore. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you think of it and you can make your mouth water. And that's because we have this amazing capacity, which probably is pretty rare there, uh, you know, out there in the in the world of mammals, that we can mammals can do mental time travel, uh, probably. You, you know, very good simulators. But we're really good at it, mm -hmm. and we do it to this incredible extent. So when Robert Sapolsky wrote his book, you know, why do zebras not get ulcers? It's because they can't mental time travel to that extent with that vividness of what Larry Barslu calls subjective realism, mm -hmm. right? So you can't just like be immersed in this memory or anticipation of a really difficult argument so much so that, you know, I have a, uh, I have a stress response and, you know, my, I get a big inflammatory response and, you know, i am uh, got muscle tension everywhere and I can't eat and... You know, so that is uh, uh, because I'm I'm not in this stressful conversation, but I am as if in it. You you know this very well because you've done work on this kind of thing. Yeah. Right? So the basic idea is that when you are simulating an experience, for example, an experience of a stressful argument or something, your body responds as if you are actually in that experience. Right. So that's and that's because our thoughts seem real in that way. Right. So when you visualize, you know, think of a strawberry, you do it well enough. And if you like strawberries and you haven't just eaten, <laughs> your mouth will water. Mm -hmm. But then if I just say when, and the way the technique is in a certain way, it's just like, see it as a thought. Like, and when I teach this, uh, demonstrate this to people, I get them to their mouths water and mm -hmm. then, okay, now do it again, visualize it. And now see it as a thought. And when you do that, for most people, it's interesting. There's, Really curious about how people react to this. Mm. So most people, it just goes poof. Disappears. Some people, it kind of like fades into the background. Mm -hmm. And generally, those people seem to be the ones who also say that they're disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were clinging, maybe. I more. guess. Yeah. I don't know. It's really... That's, a, that's a really interesting to think about individual differences and in how yes. we let go of thoughts. Yes. How easily we can let go of thoughts. How sti That's the stickiness concept that right. Richie yes. has talked about. And, yeah. Yes, exactly. So when it goes poof, actually, that actually is a technique also. The poof moment can then be used to do a non-dual kind of meditation because uh -huh. you can still... What are you paying attention to then? Right, the emptiness that's there isn't left. anything there. Yeah, right. But you're attending, you're aware. Yeah. So then that that kind of you know subject object kind of structure can then attenuate a little bit, and that yeah. that even can be used. Yeah. It is used as a technique in uh, like Chakzok Mahmudra Dzogchen traditions that particular kind of moment. But also, it's really powerful as a as a means of just like helping as a as a trick or a skill for people who are really getting caught up in their thoughts. Just like look at it directly. It's just a thought. Poof meditation. Yeah, poof meditation. <laughs> so it's called the self-liberation of thoughts when you put it in a traditional mm -hmm. context. And in some ways, that's kind of an advanced practice. But as a technique, it can be very ther therapeutically useful. Yeah. So that, you know, so decentering, sometimes So when people talk about decentering, sometimes they mean that. Sometimes they mean psychological distancing. Sometimes they seem to mean something entirely different that I haven't figured out yet. Yeah. Like some kind of just reinterpretation of experience. Reappraisal kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's all a bit messy. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So I think there's more work to be done on that construct. But uh, so decentering is not really about non-dual experience. Dereification can be. Yeah. Could be a technique for it.
Well, I know we're coming up on our time. Um, just given your experience in the field, uh, where do you think the field should be going now or what's kind of the most important thing that we should be looking at? I think that we need more people like me and I wish there were more people like me, uh, meaning... We all do. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a pretty like egotistical thing to say, wasn't it? But what I mean is that I, I get, know what you mean. I also I get, wish there were more people. I get like called you. a lot, you know, because there are not that many of my Buddhist studies colleagues who really seem to want to engage in with this kind of work. And or, there aren't many humanities scholars and you know religious studies scholars who are able to and get you know it's a difficult uh, yeah, to I speak both languages i think yeah, I, yeah it's true yeah. and i did have you know as i say but i haven't had any formal education since an undergrad i've done a lot of informal education yeah, and my scientific colleagues but part of it is i just gotten used to you know not knowing and not and realizing <laughs> i don't need to know like i'm terrible on brain anatomy i have no idea like the amygdala yeah, it's not your role the amygdala is a little bit behind the occipital lobe is that it <laughs> i think so yeah right I'm not quite that bad, but uh, like, I don't even want to know. And you don't need I to. I have deliberately, yeah. I've had moments where I think, oh, you know, I should really learn more brain anatomy. And I go, nope, don't do that. Because <laughs> I'll never be an expert it's, in brain anatomy. And I don't need to be because I can be. ask you. Yeah, you can look it up. It's I don't even have to look it up. important to memorize. I wouldn't yeah. bother to look it up. I just <laughs> yeah. call you up and say, hey, right. Wendy, you know, <laughs> you know, the nucleus accumbens. <laughs> yeah, so I don't need to know. And actually part of it, uh, and this is the thing about interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work is really getting used to like being comfortable with not knowing you, you don't need to be an expert so and you're also very and, skilled at translation literally language translation but this is another kind of translation yeah i mean which, that's part of it yeah. and also maybe the personalities like richie and i hit it off right mm -hmm. away and that helped a lot mm -hmm. and when antoine came we also became friends very yeah. quickly so you know maybe that's part of it sure. but i also think that it's tough when you're an academic and you're not really supposed to not know things <laughs> Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> and, uh, you know, PhD means piled higher and deeper. <laughs> yeah, so right. you think you know everything, right? About the tiniest window of yes, things. Yes, that's how much of the, yeah. you know, how much poop you can produce <laughs> is piled higher and deeper. Yeah. Yes, um, just more and more of it. But uh, that's one obstacle, I guess, for people. So I do wish there were more people. Yeah. And there are some people, mm -hmm. you know, who've been engaging. Students who you've trained are, are some, good at this. Yeah, some, yeah. some of them, definitely. And, uh, you know, and some of like, one of my students, David Saunders, is actually a psychiatrist, yeah. right? So uh, so that's a totally different kind of context. Yeah. But, um, and there are other people like Bill Waldron and mm -hmm. people who've been involved in modern life, you know, definitely mm -hmm. people out there. But it'd be great to see more of that. Evan is actually an example yeah, of someone too, Evan great. Thompson. Yep. So um, I think that actually that's one thing is getting more people like that involved. Mm -hmm. But even just those people, regardless of whether they want to directly engage with scientists, doing more anthropological work on what people, not what the texts say, not even what the teachers say, but what do practitioners actually do yeah. when they do retreats. And uh, it, I think it's so important, like, you know, what is just like a good ethnography of meditation communities mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what they do. And there are a few things out there that are kind of in that direction, but uh, not quite really that finely grained yet, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Maybe I'm, I'm uh, ignorant. Undoubtedly, I am I'm ignorant of something written, but uh, I'm nothing's crossed, mm -hmm. you know, my yeah. desk yet. So that's a biggie, mm -hmm. really getting better at describing what people are doing. Yeah. Another biggie is really getting better at trying to understand individual differences. Sure. You know, and why some practices work for some people and they don't work for other people. Yeah. And what is it about those people? And uh, I think, you know, some of that is about statistical power and having big enough studies. But I think some of it is also getting better at really hypothesizing what's going on. Mm -hmm. And that's the next one, which is like getting, you know, there's been more attention. Like when I first got involved in this field, meditation was just a black box. Yeah. Like, you know, meditate. Something happens. Right. You know, it's not Stick even you in any, the scanner. Yeah. Whatever kind of is it's just a meditation. Yeah. Right. It's not even, you know, F A O M, you know, leave alone something more finely right. grained. It's just like, oh, meditation. You know, yeah. put someone in the meditation box and yeah. they come out the other side, you know, yeah. with with horns on their head. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. Yeah, you know. So uh we're much much better than that, but still we need a lot more work on on mechanisms, mm -hmm. you know, and really being very clear about the constructs of different styles of meditation mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So that's another really big place. And then there are very specific kind of capacities that seem to apply in many different styles, you know, maybe even all styles, but certainly many different styles. 
that we need better measures of. Mm, mm -hmm. So dereification, so Esther Papias and I Barsler have done some great work there that you know about, you've even been involved in. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, But I think those measures, they're good, but I think we can get even better sure. ones. And uh, also a biggie, another biggie is meta-awareness. Yeah. Even the explicit kind of, you know, moment of judgment, mm -hmm. we could probably get better at that. But if somehow we could get more at this kind of implicit metacognition uh, that I think we... The background. Yeah, awareness. that sort of background awareness mm -hmm. that's presenting affect and, you know, and so on. Yeah. It would be finding a way to get in, drill down into that or just to assess, just to measure it would be, would be good. And I don't think we have any measures at all yeah, of that yeah so we're trying to i think you know these are the kinds of things at the center for healthy minds that we're definitely thinking about yeah. uh you know and our old friend and colleague christy wilson mendenhall is yes. actually uh working on some ideas for measures right now yeah so we'll see where that goes but uh yeah those are i think really important yeah. just a few of the really um, important things great well we didn't even get to touch on a bunch of things i wanted to talk about like concepts and free will and prediction and all these but maybe we can have a part two sometime <laughs> okay sure <laughs> well thank you so much for joining us today it's been great to talk with you my pleasure wendy this episode was edited and produced by me and phil walker music on the show is from blue dot sessions and universal show notes and resources for this and other episodes can be found at podcast.mindandlife.org if you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on iTunes and share it with a friend. If something in this conversation sparked insight for you, we'd love to know about it. You can send an email or voice memo to podcast at mindandlife.org. Mind and Life is a production of the Mind and Life Institute. Visit us at mindandlife.org, where you can learn more about how we bridge science and contemplative wisdom to foster insight and inspire action towards flourishing. There you can also support our work, including this podcast.